done it. So Jesus has had this um, conversation with this woman. He asks for a drink of water. Uh, she says, how are you going to get get the water? And uh, you have nothing to, to, um, to put down into, into the well. And, uh, and he says, if, if you uh, knew uh, the, who it is, the gift of God and who it is that is speaking to you, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And then we talked about that living water, that that living water is salvation. Um, and um, it, it leads into this, um, this conversation uh, with the woman, and he ends up saying, go call your husband and come here. And the woman answered him, I have no husband. And then he proceeds to let her know that he knows way more than she realizes, that she's had five husbands, and the man she's living with now, she's not married to. Um, and then and then she, of course, uh, says, I, I, can, I can see that, sir, I can see that you are a prophet. And we talked about the Samaritan belief about to head, right? We, we talked about... Uh, the prophet like Moses, and, and the prophet like Moses, um, this is this is uh, God speaking in Deuteronomy, uh, speaking to Moses, and he says this: I will raise up from them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. That was seen from from that time on as a prophecy of Messiah, that Messiah would come. So that prophet, and we've talked about this when, when uh, the Jews were uh, questioning John and saying, are you that prophet? Same thing. The prophet like Moses is, is Messiah. Uh, and so uh, they called Messiah to hell. Uh, and so she's saying um, uh, that... Um, uh, so Jesus said to her, go call your husband. Um, sir, uh, and, and the woman said to him, um, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. Uh, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. And the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah, I know that Teheb in her language, is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. So he's claiming to be Messiah. He's claiming much more than that. Um, and um, uh, so, so Teheb was seen as Messiah or at least a Messiah-like figure. And she's not ready yet to declare him to be Teheb, but she now sees that Jesus is more than he was. Um, and uh, he's at very least uh, a messenger of God. Um, and, and when Jesus says, um, yeah. we're gonna, we're gonna wait. Uh, so um, she's remaining in the light. That's admirable. Um, she's she's um, going to deflect Jesus' inquiry probably because she's embarrassed that he knows so much about her. Uh, and she's going to try to change the subject, but she doesn't walk away. Uh, she at very least continues to engage in the conversation. Not that we would all do that. Our faith gets hard and our life gets hard. Stay in communication. We only want to be in Oftentimes we turn away in those times. We need to stay in the light um, and stay in communication with God. Uh, so let's talk about what true worship means. And, and, and that's this passage that we just read. I think this was a deflection on her part, where um, where she says, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. I, I think what she's saying, what she, like in her head she's thinking is, 
Let's talk about what divides us so I can avoid what is convicting me. He's making me uncomfortable. He knows so much about me. So let's change the subject. Uh, and so she may also be bringing up this topic to test Jesus or, or to prove, prove her own theological awareness. Who knows? Um, but Jesus refuses to engage in her. Uh, and he tells us what true worship is. Uh, true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people who will worship him. Um, uh, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So Jesus is bringing it back again. It's what is worship? What is worship? And what Jesus' answer is that not Samaritan, it's not Samaritan worship, nor is it Jewish worship. He says, we, at least we worship what we know. You worship what you don't know. So at least the Jews worship what they do know. But even that's inadequate. Even that isn't um, enough. Why? Because they'll both soon be replaced. They'll both soon become obsolete. They will be replaced when the hour comes. When it's coming. The hour is coming. And he says that when true worship comes, people will worship in spirit and truth. Now, this is this is one concept, not two. Like, okay, I've got to worship in spirit, and i got to worship in truth. What does it mean to worship in spirit? I don't know. What does it mean to worship in truth? It, it's, it's not, it, it's one concept. Uh, it's not tied to a place. Worship that's in spirit and truth is not tied to a place. Well, we got to go to church to worship. No, you don't. Everything you do, to the best of your ability, for the glory of God, is an act of worship. My basketball team, with my basketball team, I talk to them about how basketball is an act of worship. If you do it to the best of your ability, and you do it for the glory of God, you're worshiping. Um, and so worship isn't about a place. It's about a person. Um, it, it's, it's empowered by a person, by God himself. And it flows out of the Spirit, out of the Holy Spirit living inside of us. It is worship that is God-centered, truth-centered. It is worship that is empowered by God and formed by his word, the truth. That's what spirit, worshiping in spirit and truth mean. Um, that we're, we're worshiping God, empowered by God, formed by his truth. Um, and then and then she tries another deflection. She's really trying hard to, to get rid of him, right? She says, um, the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. So again, I think she's trying to get out of the conversation. She implies that they'll both have to wait uh, for Messiah. Uh, to see if he's right. She's basically saying, time will tell, or we'll see about that. Um, so she's not quite clear yet. Uh, she does not um, yet understand what is being offered and who it is that is offering it to her. But she's getting closer. Now, Jesus, when she says Christ is coming, he says of himself, I who speak to you am he. You remember, I hope, me talking to you about uh, when Jesus uses I am statements. When he says I am, and we're going to see later in John that he's going to say before Abraham was, I am. That name is God's self-revelatory name. It's the name he gave himself or, or said for himself uh, with uh, Moses. When Moses said, well, they're going to ask me who sent me in Egypt. So what's your name? And that's the AKB, by the way. And, and God said, I am. Tell them I am sent you. Tell them Yahweh sent you. 
So everywhere in John, when Jesus is saying, I am, he is saying, I am God. And it becomes even more obvious um, when we see it in the Greek. Uh, and uh, in, in the Greek, well, I skipped some things here, but I'll point it out. Um, in the Greek, literally, it says, I am who speaks to you. Uh, and so this is the name for God. It's frequently used in John. Uh, we, we will see over and over again, I am the good shepherd. I am the door of the sheep. Um, over and over. And, and sometimes the connection is obvious. Sometimes it's not. Here it's obvious. I am who speaks to you. Yahweh speaks to you. Um, I believe Jesus uh, is, is intentionally making this connection when he says, I am who speaks to you. So she's going to leave because the disciples show up. And so now there's not just one man, there's 13 men. And that's going to freak her out a little bit, I think. So, uh, and then we're going to get a little uh, uh, comic relief from, from uh, these uh, disciples as well. Just then, his disciples came back. Uh, they marveled that he was talking with a woman. But no one said, what do you seek, or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her uh, water jar and went away into town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? Uh, they went out of the town and were coming to him. Uh, meanwhile, the disciples were urging, well, you know what, I want to talk about that just a little bit. This is a long, a long passage. So the disciples get back, um, and um, uh, the, woman, the woman leaves. She leaves the uh, disciples to come back, and they're surprised. They're absolutely surprised. They're shocked. Um, they're so surprised they were apparently speechless for a while. They, they were surprised to find, it wasn't just that they were surprised to find Jesus <coughs> speaking with a woman, any woman, but especially about spiritual things. And why would he have, why would he be talking to her at all? And especially about spiritual things. Um, it was considered in Jesus' day to be a profaning of the sacred things to teach girls or women theology. It profaned God. And that's Jewish girls. This is a Samaritan that he's having this theological uh, conversation. Um, and so here's Jesus, as Gary Burge puts it, talking to a singularly irreligious woman about matters of most utmost spiritual profundity. He isn't just talking to her. Um, and so then, as we read, the woman leaves, uh, and she leaves her jar uh, there. Was she in a hurry? Maybe. Was it a courtesy? Here, you get your own drink. Maybe. I, I don't know. Uh, it may also be a symbol of her leaving her behind the dead water, a water that doesn't satisfy, and the life that goes with it, leaving behind her old life as well. Um, and then we also see evangelism here. She goes to the people um, of the town, um, and, uh, and she says, I've met this guy. Could he be the Messiah? He told me everything about me. So she tells them about Jesus and what he did for her. And then she invites them to experience Jesus for themselves. What a beautiful, simple picture of evangelism. Tell them about Jesus. Invite them to be with you. I think she's being in the beginning. She's figuring this out. But meanwhile... The disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food uh, to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? Uh, Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. 
Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are quite ready for harvest. Um, already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. So meanwhile, we've got um, uh, Jesus uh, telling them that um, that he has his, his own food, I guess. They say, come on, Jesus, eat. And we see this misunderstanding again with the disciples. And my second favorite line in this whole thing is, do you order food or something? Where, where do you get food out there? Um, and so he explains with the farming metaphor. And there's no need to agonize over the meaning here, although scholars love to do that. Jesus is just saying proverbially that in the farming world, there's a gap between when you plant and when you harvest. You don't, you don't plant and then pull it up right away. You have to wait. Uh, but in the spiritual, and, and by the way, that time, that, that downtime is a time of supposedly when the farmer can rest, as if farmers ever rest, no resting. Um, but in the spiritual world, there is no such gap. Uh, in fact, here comes the harvest uh, of the seed that, that uh, he just sowed in the woman. Uh, he says, uh, look up. Uh, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see the fields are white for harvest. I'm not even talking about an actual field. I, sh I think he's saying, look, they're coming. Go talk to me. They, they're they're going to come, uh, come get to know me. Um, and so there was no there was no gap between the sowing of the seed and the woman and the people coming to Christ. Um, and many, many believe. Oh, one more. Uh, many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard and for ourselves, and we know this is indeed the Savior of the world. So they had this opportunity to experience Jesus. And once they experienced Jesus, they came to personal faith in him. They've experienced him and his living water. And he offers, and they've taken a big old drink. Second hand faith isn't faith. Your relationship is with Jesus. I've told you this before. God doesn't have to create children, He only has children. And we are either His child. Great. I hope you're not only So I want to conclude this with with two points of of application. When I teach a, I don't know that I've told you this yet, but when I teach from a passage of scripture, I have three goals. I want to tell you what it says. I want to tell you what it means. And I want to tell you how to apply this to your life. So what does it say? What does it mean? How can I tell this? And to me, the most we need to do the what does it say, what does it mean to get to the application. But the application is the most important thing. If our faith is only up here, it's not really faith. Faith is, is lived out. Our faith isn't just up here. It's here. What we do, it's not just what we believe, it's who we are, it's what we do. It's how we treat other people. Um, it's how we uh, care for other people. So I want to give you two points of application. And the first one is this, exposing what is hidden. It was probably common knowledge to the people in Sikar that this woman had a very checkered past. She was a sinful woman. 
But as far as she knew, Jesus had no knowledge of her sin. I think we can be guilty of that sometimes. We become happy-faced Christians. How are you doing? Oh, I'm blessed. I'm like, oh, I'm doing great. Yeah, oh, everything's wonderful. When inside, far from God, we're um, uncertain of our faith. Uh, and we don't want people to know what's really going on in our lives and our homes. Here's what I want to tell you about sin. Hiding sin only makes it more powerful. When we, when we keep our sin a secret, it owns us. When we release that and, and, and say that uh, to someone we trust, um, here's what Gary Burge says about this idea. Um, here we have a potential disciple who has hidden a profound sin in her life. Perhaps it is a way of life that must be addressed. But Jesus recognizes that there is no going forward, no reaching living water until this hidden thing is exposed and cleansed. As we speak, my 22-year-old um, niece is in surgery. Um, she uh, had a gallstone that caused her gallbladder to be and I had been in the hospital for several days and they tried to clear the infection. But they have to take that gallbladder. And that's what's happening right now. Uh, and she, uh, there's no going forward for her uh, in, a, in a healthy, vital way. If she has that gallbladder, it has to be taken out of her. It has to be taken out of her. Picture of our sin. That if we just let it fester, it just gets bigger. It just the control it has over us just gets greater. I have no desire to step on anyone's toes. I have no desire to embarrass anyone or to force conviction. But I would like you to just consider this one. Um, is there a sin that you need to bring into your life? Are you hiding something that Jesus desires to expose, not to the world, but to get it out of you and cleanse? When, when sin is brought into the light, its power is broken. And just as it was with the woman at the well, the power was broken. James 5.16 uh, says this, Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Um, I, was, I, I was blown away by Angie Klein's uh, chapel talk. And she laid out her sins. They had no longer have any hold on them Because she has released them. And, and my my advice to you would be find someone you trust. Someone older than you. Don't tell it to a group. Especially not a teenager. Find an adult that you trust that will hold your trust. Tell that person. Ask them to pray for you. Ask them to keep you accountable. Ask them to, uh, when, when Josh was younger, and I, and I don't want to go into details, but there was a thing in his life that he shouldn't have been doing. And he, his, his, um, his youth pastor called him, Josh, 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 and, um, and, and we need that. We need accountability. We need someone to help us with that. Um, so um, the second uh, application is, is two questions. The first question is, where is Samaria today? Now, I don't mean where is Samaria on the map. It's not there anymore. 
it's 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 not called Samaria anymore. But that's not what I'm asking. Where is Samaria today? Jesus took his disciples way out of their comfort zones. They didn't want to go through Samaria. I can guarantee you that. And they and 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 then he told them, "This is what matters. This is what true um, true ministry means." Uh, this is the kind of stuff that is God's will, to go to the forgotten, to go to those who are outcast, to go to those in need and help them. Uh, and so where is that place today? If you look in the Old Testament, and in the New Testament too, if you want, but, but if you look in the Old Testament, God has always been all about seeking justice for those who are are disenfranchised, those who are forgotten, those who are downtrodden. Just look up in your concordance the words widow, alien, and orphan. Alien doesn't mean outer space, it means form. And over and over, God says, take care of the widow, the alien, and the orphan. The widow, the foreigner, and the orphan. You know what they have in common? In Jesus' name, a widow had no room. Because they can't. Unless somebody helped her. It was supposed to be her son. Or she didn't have any sons. Or neutral, you don't understand. They're not, they're not prepared. Lord, God, yes. Over and over and over again, God says, take care of these people who can't take care of themselves. Here's what I believe. Because going to the widow, the alien, the orphan, and going to those places and being the hands and feet of Jesus is not comfortable. And it can be hard. And it can be, it can, it can be fearful. I think the modern American church is very married to comfort. And, we're, and we love our, our comfortable lives. Both, both physically and spiritually. Now, look, I'm not pointing fingers at anyone because I will tell you, I, and I think you know I've been to Africa three times, for years, from the time I was a teenager on until I was probably 40-some years old, I said, I, 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 told, I had this deal with God. Just don't send me to Africa. Just don't send me to Africa. You want to know why? Snakes. I hate snakes. I'm petrified, like even of the garter snakes in my yard. I'm petrified. It doesn't matter how big it is, how small it is. I hate snakes. There was one in my house last night. I walked down. I thought I got to the bottom step. I'm like, what's that? I started to reach down to, to pick it up. It was trash, and it slithered away. And I, I ran faster up those stairs than I have run in years when that happened. <laughs> I hate snakes. So I'm not pointing. I'm not pointing. Uh, fingers at you, but as I just told you, I've been there three times. So what changed me from being a person who was petrified? There was this song back when I was in college called "Please Don't Send Me to Africa." It was a Christian song. It was a parrot uh, about, and, and and everybody thought it was hilarious. I didn't think it was funny. I was that was serious. Please don't send me to Africa. Um, so what happened to take me from a person who was petrified to go to Africa to a woman who was begging God for the opportunity? So where is Samaria? I want to tell you about um, about my personal Samaria experience. Seventeen years ago, I was asked by a former FCA student that I knew from the time she was a freshman. Um, I was her FCA leader, uh, and she and her husband asked me if I would be a family friend at this point and be the Bible school. And um, it's a Christian camp for children who are 7 to 11 years old who are in or have been in the foster care system. So all of these children have been abused in the home. And if you've been removed, removed from your home, you can go there. Uh, and so I said yes. Now I got halfway there and I said out loud, I don't even like the camp. What am I doing? But I've gone 17 years in the camp. I have no plans to stop. So I tell them until I until I'm with Jesus, 
who are no longer in, um, used to be done. But I remember the moment. I remember the moment. I was near the pool when a group, uh, a cabin group of little girls, um, probably seven years old, um, were walking to the pool and they were in their, their little flip flops and in their um, swimsuits and they were so excited. And this little girl ran up to me and looked up at me. And I don't even remember what she said, but she was just telling me everything they'd done that morning. And she's so excited we're going to the pool and I'm looking up and like, oh, that's just great. That's just great. And she walks in my head. My heart breaks, and it breaks every time, every year. And every year, I pray the same prayer, break my heart for what breaks yours. And my heart broke in a way that I can't even describe to you. You can tell it's even in this room right now. That's being the hands and feet of Jesus. And you know what caused me to go from a woman who was petrified to go to Africa to a woman who was begging uh, the, the opportunity to go, it was the faces of Zambian orphans on the, on the screen of my church and realizing these are my campers. They just live in Zambia. And so I went. So where is Samaria today? That's where the people need you. And God has... God has tasked us with going to them and telling them what they're doing. So here's question two. Will you go? Will you go? God has a plan to reach the world in Jesus' name, and you're it. You are the plan. I am the plan. God has a plan to feed the hungry. Give me a minute. Give me a minute. God has a plan to feed the hungry, and clothe the naked, and care for the widow and the orphan. And guess what? We are it. That's what he wants us to do. How will we respond? That's it.